11th December 2022, Golden Calf in the House of God, Part 2, by Pastor Simon James. Greetings in the name of Jesus and welcome to Riverside Tabernacle. I'm Pastor Simon and it's my honor to share God's word with you. We trust you will find this message inspiring and uplifting. May you be receptive to the voice of the Blessed Holy Spirit. A quick appeal to you, if our messages are helpful, if you find them helpful and informative, we suggest you subscribe to our YouTube channel, Riverside Tabernacle SA, to be notified of new videos as they come. Or simply search for at Riverside Ministries on YouTube to locate our channel. If you subscribe and like, you will have done your bit to distribute this message to a wider audience. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, we come before you this morning. We thank you, Lord, for another opportunity to listen to your word. We pray, O oh Lord, even as I stand in the gap to speak your word, I pray, O oh Lord, that you will bless me and bless the videographer. I pray, O oh Lord, that this word will go out to your children far and wide and that they will not just be hearers of the word, but doers as well. Holy Spirit, we ask you to speak to our minds in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Golden calf in the house of God part two. Last week I started with the initial discourse on Exodus 32 verses one to six. And I'm going to read it again very quickly. Now when, now when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people assembled around Aaron and said to him, come, make us a God who will go before us. For this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has happened to him. Aaron said to them, Tear off the gold rings which are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people tore off the gold rings that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. Then he took the gold from their hands and fashioned it with an engraving tool and made it into a cast metal calf. And they said, this is your God, Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And now when Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. So the next day they got up early and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and to drink and got up to engage in lewd behavior. Praise God for the reading of his word. The sound of sin. Moses had been on Mount Sinai for 40 days. The Israelites at the foot of the mountain were growing increasingly impatient. There were some there who wanted to stage a coup and take over the leadership from Moses. They needed a strat their strategy was to unite the people against Moses and usurp his leadership. The only fault that they could find with the man of God was that he had not returned yet. So they were claiming that he'd either deserted them or he had probably been uh, struck dead by God in God's presence because maybe he was sinful or whatever. Whatever it is, they were trying to stage a coup d'etat when Moses was away. Soon a growing section of the assembly rallied behind these so-called leaders. Now someone once said that the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. Now Aaron and the Levites, who were good men, stood by and watched. Aaron went further. He ventured to help. He built the calf. He made the fashion the calf. He proclaimed a feast and he built an altar. He made the golden calf, no doubt, coerced by the crowd. They bullied him. And Aaron compromised to save himself by declaring or proclaiming a festival. The ringleaders called the golden calf the God of Israel. They equated this golden calf, this idol, which was lifeless, with the God of Israel, with Yahweh, Jehovah. 
I am that I am. The people accepted the deception and Israel started slippering, slipping down the slippery slope into ungodliness and sin. On the mountain, God asked Moses to return to the people because the people had corrupted themselves by serving an idol. You see, God knew what was happening. God is omniscient. As Moses and Joshua descended the mountain, they heard noise coming from the camp. Joshua thought that it was a sound of battle and he said so. But Moses knew that it was the sound, the sound of sin. In a lewd display of lustful abandon, the children of God behaved like the spawn of Satan. What Moses and Joshua saw was a wild crowd of people, many half naked, engaging in sinful acts that were typical of Baal worshippers. The nation chosen by God to be holy unto him had become an unholy, unruly mob of sinners. The sound of sin can still be heard in our churches today and among our congregations in the 21st century. Like Aaron, many of our leaders have abandoned the priesthood to become priests of the people. They've abandoned the priesthood of God to become priests of the people. They want to be liked by the people. They want to be popular with the people. Being a priest of the people is an act of compromise and a herald of the sound of sin, for it is sin. I want to talk to you about the descent into ungodliness. The golden calf represents man's descent into ungodliness. Man has a tendency to keep going back to ungodliness, to a trophy. You know, they say when something is built, if it is not maintained, it breaks down. A trophies or atrophy, they call it atrophy. It will break down and go back to small particles or original uh, particles that it was. I mean, if you look at a building, if you leave that building unattended over, a, over many years, it will break down slowly and eventually that building will disappear. It might take a long time, but it will. Now man by his fallen nature is susceptible to sin and sinning. It is a constant spiritual battle of the mind. And Paul says this well in Romans 7.15. For I do not understand what I am doing. For I am not practicing what I want to do. But I do the very thing I hate. He said. I have in my mind this battle. Raging. Between. Almost between. My good self. And my bad self. It's almost as if I have an angel on my right hand telling me to do good. And an angel on, uh, or a fallen angel on my left side telling me to do bad. Okay. I'm just choosing sides, sides arbitrarily. He says, I don't know what's happening with me. I don't understand it because I'm not doing what I want to do. I want to do good, but it just never happens. I don't want to do bad, but I'm doing it. So I'm doing what I'm not, uh, what I don't, what I hate and I'm not doing and I'm and I'm do, not doing the thing I love. You see, one can conquer the sinful nature or one cannot conquer the sinful nature without spiritual warfare. It is a battle. It is a spiritual battle. It's not a fleshly battle. You're not fighting against something that you can feel that's tangible. You're fighting a spiritual battle. The flesh is constantly seeking gratification. The flesh is always looking for its own needs, which is often contrary to spiritual needs. There are physical needs which must be met, but only those which support spiritual warfare. The flesh must be kept as holy as far as possible. Moses people lost the spiritual battle. They, they gave in to their cravings for meat, excessive alcohol intake and sex. Food, drink, and sex can be your downfall. These are necessary in moderation, but excessive indulgence is a slippery slide into a pit of ungodliness, into an abyss of sin. It did not take Israel long to degenerate into sin. Now all sin is against God, whether it is a direct rebellion or sin against another person. It is always 
against God. In the final analysis, it is God's law that has been violated. So one ought to avoid the indulgences that lead to sin. We are all sinful by nature, but willfully breaking God's law is full-blown ungodliness. If one looks critically at churches, one will see that most focus on gratification of the flesh. The focus is on self-satisfaction and happiness, not on pleasing God and holiness. The congregation is looking for an assurance that it is good and going to heaven. And that is the greatest deception of man and false teachers, that you are fundamentally good. You don't have a problem. You're going to heaven. Motivational preachers provide the euphoria and the belief in this. The Israelites wanted to be happy. God wanted them to be holy. Aaron, who was supposed to keep them holy, succumbed to the demand to be happy. Pastors, beware you don't compromise holiness. It is the beginning of the rapid descent into the pit of ungodliness. Be sure punishment awaits. Turn your eyes to God. The golden calf represents the worship of man, which is typical of many churches. When the pastor is absent, the people backslide. Why is that? Because they use the pastor as a crutch. They use the pastor as a mediator. So their trust in Jesus is not a trust in Jesus. It is a trust in God and it is, the, it is a trust in man. So it is a false religion. And many of us Christians are actually in false Christianity. We are practicing a false version of Christianity because we support the man, not the God behind the man. When the man is not there, we fall away. And that is what happened when Moses was away. Moses was away for six weeks, almost six weeks, 40 days, and two days short of six weeks. And while he was away, the people degenerated. The congregation atrophied. The people of their religion disintegrated because Moses was not there. They needed Moses to look at. They needed Moses to tell them what to do for when he wasn't there, they fell down. And that's typical of many of our congregations. If the pastor is absent, the people don't know what to do. And that is false religion because the Bible tells you in the center of the Bible, Psalm 118 verse 8, it is better to put your trust in the Lord than to trust in man. The Bible says elsewhere that the arm of flesh will fail you. We need, there is a place for your pastor, there is a place for your prophets, but you have to know that all they're doing is aiding you to have a better relationship with God. They are not the mediator. That is Jesus. He's, they are not the mediators. All they are do, they do is your, I, they are your advisors. They are your leaders. They are evangelists. Now it seems as if people fear the leaders more than God. I know of people. We will not, we will not do anything by taking alcohol or having a smoke in front of their pastor. They will not use an, a swear word in front of their pastor. But the moment he's gone, they will do whatever they want to do. They will do anything in excess. But, now I'm not telling you how to live your life, but I'm telling you this, that such behavior shows more reverence for the man of God rather for the, than for the God of the man. Is it because we cannot see God that we have behaved like that? Are we ex exhibiting the ostrich syndrome? So if I stick my hand in the sand and I can't see you because my head's in the sand, then you can't see me or God can't see you. Let me tell you, God is omniscient. God can see you wherever you are. He fills the universe. He surrounds this universe of ours. Now, if knowing all this, we still have this case of men fearing man more than God. It begs the question, do they even know their Lord? Do they even know the Lord? Do they know God? 
or are they coming to church? I know lots of people will tell you, come to church. You'll get better. Come to church. This is and this will happen and that will happen. It is not about coming to church. It is about coming to Jesus. It is about being loyal to Jesus. It is about putting Jesus above the church, above the pastor, before the man and before the church. Now such behavior where men reverence other men more than God is typical of spiritual infancy, not spiritual maturity. It's typical of people who are still infants in the body of Christ. They haven't learned how to walk yet with the Holy Spirit. They need somebody to change their nappy, their spiritual nappy. They need a pastor to tell them what to do, to feed them. They are still being fed on milk. I know that there are many, and you probably know, there are many Christians who are years in the church, 20, 30 years in church, and, and they still need milk or spiritual milk. They need to learn the basics and that too, it's not sticking. And then you get others who have been Christians for a year or six months or two years, and you see they just rise up in maturity and they just seem to eclipse the others. You see, it's about putting God first, turning your eyes toward the Lord. Now God is not blind. He knows everything. When Moses was absent, Moses had told them that he was going away for a while to speak to God. He probably didn't know how long it would take. But he was going to come back. But the people saw his absence as an opportunity to retrogress, an opportunity to sin. They saw Moses' absence. Some of them might have seen it as an opportunity to, to sin. Others who wanted to take over the leadership saw it as an opportunity to claim abandonment. How does Moses is gone? He's not coming back. We don't know. Maybe he died. Maybe he told God something. Maybe he sinned. Maybe he didn't remove his sandals and God, the presence of God killed him. So we are here. Let's make another God. Let's make a banner. Let's walk with it in front of all the people and let them follow us. Now, many of us in churches have a different banner. We carry something, an idol. Maybe it's the man, the, 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 maybe it's the pastor. Maybe it's a concept of the church. Maybe it is a, a method of doing things. And we carry that as a banner. Maybe it is riches. Our church, there's our golden calf. This is our golden calf. Money is our golden calf. And if you come to this church, you will get money as you need it, more than you need it. So let's go with this. This is a banner we carry. And that is what they said to Aaron. Make us a God. To go before us. You see, while Moses was out of line of sight, while he couldn't see them, they couldn't see him. They went astray. But the Lord had seen their sin and he had judged their hearts already. He knew when he told Moses, get thee down to the people for the people have corrupted themselves with an idol. Now, a defining feature of the modern church is that its leaders are being elevated to the status of gods. Now, I'm not picking on anybody here, but you look at the ministries that are named in the name of the person. Okay, There's nothing wrong with that. It's got an identity. But look at some of these so-called mega churches and some of the small churches. We must not forget that these mega churches also started quite small. They started probably with the true gospel as recorded in the Bible. And slowly they started to twist these scriptures and slowly change their focus from God to the man of God. Or from the word of God to the word of the man of God. So the pastor reads the word. He interprets it and he tells you and you believe it. So whatever he says, he does. You do. You, you believe. 
You don't read the word for yourself. Now the Bereans, Paul applauded them for looking into the word of God and making sure that what he told them was true. That it was in line with the word of God. There is a verse in the Bible which says, if you will bow down to me, I will give you all these things. But that is actually not a satanic verse, but it is the voice of Satan trying to tempt the Lord. Now, if I used that in my church, I would get a lot of people into my church because I could tell them that this is what the Bible says. And if they are foolish enough not to read the word of God, they'll get duped into it. You see, so a defining feature of the modern church is that its leaders are elevated to the status of God's and what they say is what goes. In fact, some of these leaders have publicly called themselves gods. Some have used the word little gods to distinguish between themselves and God, but they misinterpreted two specific verses in the Bible and call themselves gods. Now, when you read those verses in context, you'll find that God was not saying that we are gods. And they call themselves gods in a twisted exposition of Holy Scripture. They've twisted the scripture. You can just about prove anything using the Bible. And that's what they've done. But the Bible is the unadulterated word of God and it must be read in context, interpreted in context, and not interpreted in your, with your mind. Always ask the Holy Spirit to lead you. Now look to the Lord, look to the Holy Spirit, not to man. The prophets and the Bible legends look to God and God alone, not to anybody else. They look to their God and God alone. Elijah, Elisha, David, Solomon, Samuel, Paul, Barnabas, Peter, all these guys, they look to Jesus. They look to God. They had ne even Abraham never looked at himself or looked at a person. The Bible says the arm of flesh will fail you. Without godly leadership, the church atrophies into ungodliness. And this descent is quicker than one might imagine. Many people think it's gradual. It's not. It's, it's much quicker than that. As soon as your spiritual God is let down, the rock begins. And how do you have your spiritual God? There are two components or three components to your spiritual God. One, read the word. Two, pray. And the third thing, third thing is listen to sound biblical teaching. Okay, those are the three things that keep your spiritual God up. Read the Bible and understand it with the Holy Spirit. Pray for understanding and listen to sound biblical teaching. If a pastor preaches anything wrong that's not with the Bible, go up to him and ask him. Maybe he's made a mistake. Maybe he'll learn. And if he understands and he apologizes or explains his viewpoint, fine. But if he's adamant that he's right and the Bible is not right, and you know the Bible is right, then you need to walk out of it. As soon as your spiritual God is let down, the rot begins, I said. Now Israel looked to Moses and not to God. And as soon as Moses, who was their spiritual God, was gone, they started to fall apart and became perfect putty for Satan's hands. And in was Satan, molding them into something that he wanted them to do. He got them so quick. His strategy was so good that he because he knows man's nature as well. He got the priest, Aaron, not only to build, a, to make them the calf, but also to build an altar and call up a sacrifice. The question today we are, that begs asking is, are they idols in our churches? Yes, of course they are. Money has become a God. Not going to church for spiritual edification. Most people go to church to seek financial increase. Most people want to go to God for they want to increase. 
enlarge my territory. Not understanding the concept. Which says in Mark, in, uh, sorry, in Matthew 6.33, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and its righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Jesus said, the Gentiles, the non-believers, the infidels, look for all this. You focus on God, and this will provide, uh, be provided, because God is Jehovah Jireh. Self is another God. In fact, he's the worst God because self-gratification precludes, excludes pleasing the Lord. Pleasing yourself means that you won't please God. And then there's a God of uh, uh, power, the God of corruption. Power is the God of corruption. And many people, men and women, hold too much sway over the church. They can change the thinking of the church. They can make the church and the people think how they want them to think and not what the Bible says. They can twist the scriptures, little gods, for example, calling themselves gods and many others. I don't want to go into names at this time. Now, these are the living idols of the church. These so-called false prophets, I mean, so-called men of God who are actually false prophets are living idols. They are charismatic leaders who groom Christian fellowship uh, uh, worshippers to worship them instead of God. They replace Jesus as the mediator between God and man. Their aim is power, money, fame and freedom. The freedom to sin in the name of Jesus. Imagine that. You sin and you endorse it with the word of God. Oh, I can do this because the word of God says this. Avoid these people and live or worship them and die with them. The results to avoid today. The golden calf is in the house of the Lord. That is my conclusion. That is the conclusion of the word of God, the Laodicean church in, in Revelation chapter 3. The golden calf is in the house of God and it's been there for a while. Its presence is clearly visible to those who are discerning spiritually. But not so to the spiritually blind. The spiritually blind think they're serving God when they're serving the shiny golden calf. And many just refuse to see. And the Bible says they are none so blind as those who will not see. So many churches have descended into the pit of ungodliness, even to the point of proudly displaying a visage of worldliness within the church. The church has become worldly. The world has infiltrated the church. When our mandate is to infiltrate the world and turn them from turn them back to God, the world has come into the church and turned the church towards the world. In the rebellion of the golden calf incident, power, gold, music, and social interaction were misused to satisfy the lustful desires of sin. In our modern churches, power, money, music, and social interaction are being used to satisfy lustful desires of the persons and sinful people. Church on Sunday is not so different from the nightclub on Saturday night. There are some churches which have smoke machines, smoke machines. They have lights. They, everything is dark. And then they have people who have no reverence for God, badly, poorly dressed, not appropriately dressed, dancing, gyrating to Christian music written by people who don't even know the Lord. So it's not any different from the nightclub that the, the youngsters were in on the previous night. A child of God is called to be holy, not happy. To please God, not himself or herself. To lay up treasures in heaven, not to lay up treasures on earth. So do not be like the Israelites who saw God's presence on the mountain as a chance to indulge, indulge themselves in willful, lustful sinning and lost their lives in pursuit of pleasure. Don't be like them. Look to God and live. We trust you've enjoyed this word and that it has been a blessing to you. If you're inspired by it, please share it with your friends and family. Remember, we're live on Facebook every Wednesday at 7 p.m. and Sunday at 10 a.m. This is Pastor Simon, and as always, it has been my pleasure. Till next time, God bless.